Okay, so I'm Professor Bill Lionheart. I work on applied mathematics. Mainly I work on seeing inside things from measuring the outside, finding landmines, medical imaging. Um, this involves partial differential equations and uh, inverse problems. But this little talk is about something um, that I, I became interested in um, a few weeks ago and I thought I'd entertain you with it. And so my, my talk is called Where Am I? In the ocean, in fact. And, and the answer is going to be something called the Symmedian point, which I hadn't actually heard of until recently. So, so fun. OK, so what if the GPS goes off? The, so usually at sea and in your car and on your phone, you navigate using a constellation of satellites, uh, GPS run by the US military, and GLONASS used by, run by the Russian military. And any time they like, they could switch it off. It's entirely at their discretion. And in fact, sometimes they even jam it in the UK. And so what happens if, if um, you know, the president of the US decided that he didn't like giving everyone free positioning information and uh, his, his mate in Russia uh, decided that he'd follow suit and we wouldn't know where we are. And OK, so that's not such a problem in Manchester, but if you're in the middle of the ocean in a ship, you have to fall back to what we used to do before we had satellite navigation. Does the clicker work? OK, so old-fashioned navigation, what we used to do well out of uh, sight of land, uses the stars, celestial navigation. So we measure the position of the uh, stars and planets relative to where we are. We do some calculations, and we, use, we have an accurate clock, and we can find our position. And there's a lot of quite interesting mathematics in that. Um, and I'm just going to concentrate on one little bit that I think is quite good fun. OK, so how do we do it? So, um, well, actually, the first thing we need is a clock, and we also need one of these, one of these things, which we look through and um, measure the angle between the star or planet or the sun and the horizon, the surface of the sea. And this one, I'll just pass this around. Please be careful with it. It's 200 years old. Uh, it belongs to one of my colleagues here. His great-grandfather was a sea captain. And it was sitting in his office, so I said, I'll, I'll borrow that. Bit. OK, so how does it work? Well, so you need this instrument to measure the position. Sorry if I go off camera. Alex. So here's mine. This is what a modern one looks like. And uh, it has filters for the sun, has a telescope for stars. And you look through there, and the, the mirror shows you a picture on the other side of the view of the star and you bring it down to the horizon, and then you read off the degrees here on a ship that's moving. <laughs> right. So that's, 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 uh, that requires um, some, some skill to do, but uh, the rest is mathematics. OK, so, so you've got to figure out what star or planet you're looking at. Um, and then what you do is, um, where's my clicker? I did promise Alex I wouldn't move around, so I'll stay in view. But I, I will try and do that now. OK, so here's, here's a star, and here's our ship on a, on a relatively flat piece of Earth. We just, you know, just imagine a small Earth scale. And I measure the angle between the horizon and the star. And this point, the, the geographic position, that's the point right under the star. So if you were there, the star would be straight ab above you, right? So as the angle goes down, you know you're further away, and at a certain angle, you'll be on a circle around the geographic position. OK, so you measure the angle it makes to the horizon, and you note the time on your watch to the nearest second. And you look up from tables or using a calculator where that object is, the GP. And um, now, we, we know roughly where we are because we knew where we were yesterday and the ship doesn't go terribly fast and we know what direction we sailed in. So, so that's where we think we are, roughly. And we look up, we, we calculate. Actually, that's quite interesting how we calculate it. We calculate the angle that it would make with the horizon and we also calculate what direction that line is in. So the bearing to this GP. And actually, the way we do that, I, I haven't got time to go into it, it's quite fun though. It involves what's called spherical trigonometry. So you know about ordinary trigonometry of triangles, but when the triangles are drawn on the surface of a sphere, so the, the lengths are also measured in angles, 
then you need a different kind of sine rule and cosine rule for spherical trigonometry. So actually working out those things relative to this, these two points um, uses some interesting spherical trigonometry, but in the end it's just sines and cosines. You can do it on your calculator. And then what you measured with the sextant, is the sextant still going round? Yeah. I, I, I guess it's, it's not a particularly good one. You'll see the mirror doesn't even work that well, but you could, you could just about use it. Um, the, so we've got this angle here. It's different from that one. And what we do is we say, um, depending on how far out it is, that tells us how far back or forwards from the AP we are. And we assume that we're on this, this line. So this, this line is, you know, in, in fact, it's a circle because distance, different angles correspond to different circles around the GP. But we, we're fairly close to where we are. So we can draw it on our, on our map as a straight line. So from one star site, we get one straight line, and we're on that straight line. OK, so um, yeah, that line's called a line of position, LOP. OK, so we now have to do it for another star or planet, and that gives us two lines. And where they cross, that's where we should be. But you should never, you should never ever m measure the number of things the same number of things as the th number of things you want. I mean, so if you want two coordinates of your position, you have to measure at least three things just to be sure, right? So what happens is you get, um, you get um, <coughs> three lines, at least, and they don't cross. And they don't cross because you're measuring this angle to the nearest 0.2 of a minute of arc, so 120th of a degree, on the heaving deck of a ship when there's water dribbling down your neck, trying to read your watch to the nearest second, and there is a margin of error. Actually, what you do is you probably measure it about six times, and some would be, would be writing down the time, and then you probably draw a graph and, and, and make the best fit, so rule out any that were really wrong, and then average them. So, so it gets a bit more accurate when you've averaged them, but still, those lines will not cross. And actually, that's not just navigation. It's typical of measuring anything, isn't it? Right. So the fact that they don't cross tells you you have some error, but um, uh, the thing is, where, where, what I'm going to talk about is where do we assume that we are if they don't cross. So ju just a little bit of an animation of, of the sextant. Um, it's got uh, uh, so a, mirror, a mirror there and a half mirror there. The thing you're measuring comes in there, reflects off the mirror. You see it in the scope. And what happens as you move this arm, it moves that mirror. And that, uh, you know, so you're seeing a different height of the sky. So there's the sun, and I brought it down to just touch the horizon. <laughs> and then the next thing I do actually is, um, uh, is I just slightly swing the sextant, and the, the sun kind of swings, or, and you just check that it just touches the horizon. And then you know it's straight up and down. So that's what you have to do. You read off the angle there, you read off the degrees there, and the minutes on that drum, and the fractions of minutes on the vernier scale there. OK, so, so the upshot of this is that we have three lines that don't cross. And that's, that's the, where, where are we? Where are we going to assume that we are on this? Well, you know, you, if we said, well, that one was rubbish, then we'd be there. Right? But, you, you know, if they're all equally accurate, then um, what's the most probable point where we are? Well, actually, if you did average lots of measurements, then the errors would tend to go like a normal distribution with a mean at this line. So there'd be a, a normal distribution at these lines, and you multiply those e to the minus something squares together. That means you end up adding the exponent. And so if you want to maximize the probability, it's the same as minimizing the sum of the squared distances to each line. Right, so not just the sum of the distances, that would give us a, a corner, actually. But you minimize the sum of the squared distances to each of those lines. Because that's how, that's how wrong we were, right? That distance. Okay. So we want to find a point that minimizes the sum of squared distances. So how are we going to do that? So the thing is, you're used to solving two equations in two variables. Which I said, you almost never actually do that in real life. If you want to find two things, x1 and x2, you want to measure three things, b1, b2, b3, 
and uh, these are linear equations, so each one's a, a straight line. I could, if I normalize these a's, that would be the components of the normal vector to the line, wouldn't it? So these would be three lines. And I want to solve that in the least squares way. Now, um, it's economical to write it in terms of matrices. Some of you will have met matrices before, but if you haven't, it's not that difficult. All I'm saying is, um, I'm, I'm taking out all the coefficients, A, and writing them in a square table, the, the unknowns in a column and the, the known things in a column. So those are called matrices. And I, I can summarize these equations as AX equals B, which means that the way that I do A times X for matrices is that the X1 and X2 multiply each of those columns. And that's what matrix multiplication is, if you haven't done it before. It's nothing particularly complicated. Um, but uh, it allows us to treat a whole bunch of equations in one go. Um, then the, the errors are these distances. So, so these are measuring how much the equations don't hold. If, if you're on one of the equations, they're zero. Right? So we want to make the, square these, add them up, and make them as small as we can. So in matrices, D is AX minus B. That's the error. So the sum of squares, D1 plus D2 plus D3, that, that's actually the length squared, Euclidean length, of that vector D. That's what I want to minimize. OK, so I'm going to tell you two ways to do this. One involves algebra, which is fairly standard and actually how it's usually done in most real life. And the other one is, is pure geometry that could have been done by the Greeks, but it turns out they didn't, as far as we know. Um, it's much more recent than that. Um, but still, the sort of thing you could easily do yourself. OK, so, um, so this length is non-negative, greater than or equal to 0, right? And I want to minimize it. Click it. So, to find a critical point, we differentiate and set to zero. It, it's a function of two variables, x1 and x2. So I'm going to have to differentiate with respect to x1, leaving x2 fixed, and then the other way around. Differentiate with respect to x2 with x1 fixed. That's called partial derivatives. But it's no different from just differentiating and assuming the other was constant. Right? So we can do that. We set those both to zero. And the thing is that because the d is squared, the, the d's are all squared, We've got something quadratic that we differentiate. So it's not a surprise that what we have to solve is then linear, right? Because we've differentiated once. And so, um, so differentiating gives us linear equations for the minimum. And the linear equations in matrix form, um, I'm going to write like this. So we had AX equals B. And now I'm multiplying by a ma another matrix called A transpose. And A transpose is just the matrix A written the other way round. Right? That's what transpose means. So you see that, that that matrix now is a two by two matrix because all the rows of this act on the... the, the there are two rows of this and then two columns of A. So, um, so, so actually this is just a linear system of two variables with two equations, so I can solve it uniquely. Well, just, just thinking about this, so I just said I found a critical point. I want it to be a minimum. But because this is bounded below by zero, it must have a minimum, right? So if there's only one critical point, I don't need to worry about derivative tests for maxima. If, if there's only one critical point, it's definitely the minimum, right? Because it, it can't go below zero. So if I find a unique solution to this, I'm all sorted. And in, in this case, as long as the three lines are, are different and not parallel, then um, I can solve these equations. And in matrix notation, I'd write it like that. In other words, I take the inverse of A transpose A onto the other side. But if you haven't done matrices, all I've done is solved a system of two equations in two unknowns. So by the time you'd written it out, you could solve it. Right? But um, if you... If you do like matrices, then if you've got a, a little two by two matrix like this and you want the inverse, then all you do is, this is a little rule, you just swap these over, change the sign and divide by this thing. That, that is, I mean, that's, if you solve simultaneous equations, you would get this anyway. It's just sort of written down in symbols. So that's all you need to do. And that gets you this point that we're after, which is 
where we are. I mean, it, or at least if the errors were normally distributed, this is where we're most likely to be. And if you're in the middle of the ocean and there's no dangers, you just put that dot there and that's where you're going to assume you are. The Admiralty Na Manual of Navigation for many, possibly centuries, has said when you have what's called a cocked hat, which is this, what they call a triangle in the Navy, um, you assume that you're at the point nearest to danger, <laughs> to the rocks or whatever, right? So there's kind of a different cut on it. But, but if, if all things are equal, then you'd assume you're in the middle, right? And this is how we get the middle. But, you know, that's, that's the middle of a triangle. And so that, now this, so that was all just algebra, and now here's the geometry. Um, and I think, well, actually I learned to navigate when I was, I learned celestial navigation when I was a little bit younger than you, actually. Um, and my instructor just said, well, you, you know, you just choose some point in the middle. <laughs> You know, that'll do. I mean, actually, rather than worry about it, you probably spend your time making some more measurements or checking what you did, right? Because like, get a few more lines and say, oh, no, that one was way off, you, you know, actually. So, so you know, um, spending time so getting three and then sitting and doing some geometry is probably not what you do unless you're quite bored on a long passage. But it, it's fun for us. Um, so, you know, w where do you choose this point? Um, other than by solving the algebra. Well, it, it, there's a kind of, this, this is where the interesting geometry comes in. So let, let's just strip off the lines, and we've just got a triangle. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just call a triangle ABC, and we're looking for this point P that's somewhere in the middle. And there are lots of centers of triangles, and some of them you'll know. Um, so here's one of the, the favorite ones. What you do is, each of the angles, you split the angle into. So you can actually do this with a pair of compasses, right? And then it turns out that if you draw those lines that split the angles, they actually all, the three of them meet. I mean, that, that's, that's a theorem, right? And the point where they meet is quite a fun point. It's one which is at the center of the biggest circle you can fit inside a triangle, the in-circle. So this is classical geometry. So this is called the in-center. And that's one, and it, you know, it is kind of, you know, it does look like the middle. You might have chosen that point, right? In center, right? Okay, that's not the point we want. That doesn't minimize the squared distances. Here's another one. This is even more obvious because it's the center of gravity of the triangle. So what you do is you split the sides in two, not the angles. Right? If you balanced it on a knife edge, and balance it on another one. Now, you'd see that this would be how you get the center of gravity. It would balance there whichever way you put your knife on it, right? And again, these three meet at a point, and this is called the centroid, and it's also the center of gravity. That's not the point we want either, right? <laughs> In fact, you might, you might know, I, before I look this up, I could think of four different centers of, of I mean, so for example, there's the biggest circle you draw outside the triangle. That's got a center. You, you know, there's a few others. It was none of the ones that I knew. So, so he, here's the two centers we've, we've mentioned, and they're different. And now I'm going to construct another one. What I do is, say, let's take this line, which is the bisector, and this one, which is the median, it's dividing in two. And then I'm going to reflect the blue line in, in the red line to get the green line. So I'm going to measure that angle and measure off the other side, right? So, and so that line I'm going to, is called the symmedian line. And then you could do that for all three of them. And it turns out, again, those symmedian lines meet at a point. That point's called the symmedian point. And that's the one we want. <laughs> so... So here's an interesting thing. You, you know, those are the other two that really look quite in the middle. This one's much closer to the shorter edge. Somehow squaring this distance kind of biases it away from the long edges. And actually, this was a take-home message for navigators. And I thought, this must be really well known to everyone who knows. And uh, really unknown to everyone else. And so I asked um, Navalist where they discussed celestial navigation. And indeed, they did know about this. 
uh, and they could construct this Semedian point, although they debated you know, whether that really was a sensible thing to do. But the thing, thing they took home from it is it's much closer to the shorter edge than you'd have thought. So uh, that's, that's the, the, fun of it, the Semedian point. Okay, so um, there's a list of triangle centers, right? Uh, in, in fact, th there's a guy called Clark Kimberling who runs a website, Encyclopedia of Triangle, so you can guess that there's more than a half a dozen. <laughs> and, and, and isn't that strange? This guy is a professional mathematician at a university, and all he's doing is Greek geometry, you know? It's like... <laughs> I mean, you, you know, I, I suppose I have colleagues who do kind of 19th century calculus as well. And, and you, you know, most of us do things that are kind of really recent and, and kind of just been invented. But it's kind of really interesting. There's plenty of old fashioned mathematics to do, right? So you can still do some Greek geometry and find different senses of the triangle and, the, and, the, and then find the properties. Um, so on, on Clark Kim Kimmelig's list, the Semedian point is number six. So you don't know how many of these are there going to be. There's an awful lot. Um, so here's a plot of some <laughs> of the special points. That s certainly some of them are centers. Um, and um, so when I say center, it's got to be a point that you get from some rule that's equal for all the sides. So if you swapped A, B, and C, you, you know, there's it's nothing special about one side. It's got to be invariant under permutation of the sides to be counted as a center. And you know, he, he numbers them. And um, uh, th there's a little bit about it on MathWorld. But um, he's currently got up to 11,800. And, and he's, he's not just making them up. They all have interesting properties, which he's enumerated. So I mean, you could probably, you know, you could get into this yourself. With, with no more mathematical knowledge, you could probably you know, add one to that. But you, the difficulty we were finding whether somebody had found it before, I think, <laughs> right? Looking it up. So, um, right, so I, di I didn't know that before about last week, you know, so our Semedian point is number six there. It's got kind of blurred with, with all of these. Um, it's interesting that they're kind of also accumulating around the, um, the, cir uh, the, 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 the circle that goes around the outside. Um, I think actually there are infinitely many in a way because if you take any three interesting centers that are not in a line, some of them do turn out to be in a line and that's a theorem to prove, then you, know, you could take those three as a triangle and then take the whatever center, you know, so you could actually go on indefinitely. But it, it's not sort of, that's a little bit facile. It, you, you know, I mean, that's kind of obvious that you can do that. The interesting thing is that they all have a list of interesting properties that are related to the other ones and so on. OK, so that's how we find where we are when um, the American and Russian presidents switch off their GPSs and GLONASS. Um, <laughs> and um, so, so what about GPS? We see GPS doesn't measure angles. It measures distances to the satellite using the time of flight. And so you're in your phone, you have a GPS. Possibly if it's a Samsung, it probably uses GLONASS as well. It's the same principle. It measures the distances. And as soon as you've got four satellites in view, you can get your position in 3D space, including the height. So what's that? It's the intersection of four planes, right? The distance, you know. Well, OK, actually, they're spheres. But you know, on a small scale, they're just planes. And so you can ask this question, and I won't provide any answer that is there the same theory for a tetrahedron where four planes intersect, as I've done for triangle. Certainly, you can do the algebra in exactly the same way. You can solve four equations in three unknowns by exactly the same formula. But does it have some interesting geometry? Yeah, I don't know, but I expect you could find out if you wanted. So that's it. That's all I want to say. Thank you.